Hello, I'm John Walsh, Associate Professor of Information Science at Indiana University, Bloomington. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to speak about text markup or text encoding, the process of adding marks or codes or tags to texts and data to say specific things about specific parts of the text. Markup is used to make assertions about the text. We may assert that a span of text is formatted a certain way in bold and italics, or that a document was created at a specific date and time, or we may assert that a span of text should be processed a certain way in a typesetting system, or that a chunk of text has a certain identity as a paragraph, a title, a link, or a line of poetry. The markup most of us are familiar with is HTML, the hypertext markup language, the language used for most web documents. A lot of my research involves literary and historical documents marked up or encoded in the text encoding initiatives flavor of XML, the extensible markup language. With colleagues and students, I create a lot of these documents transcribed and edited from original sources. I also use in my research XML documents and data created by others and harvested from the web and through APIs to various information resources. We'll be looking at modern electronic digital markup like XML in a moment, but it's helpful to understand that markup is an old concept that we're already very familiar with from written and print as well as digital culture. Here is a text with virtually no markup. It looks strange to most of us because we're used to markup, but it wasn't so strange to the Greeks and Romans who wrote this way, with all capital letters and no spaces between words. Words are there, but it's difficult for us to identify them without the markup of white space, and the lack of markup introduces ambiguity. Is this string of text the hearts in us or the heart sinus. Both are reasonably good band names, but we would still like to know what the author intended us to read. In these next few slides, we will see different layers of markup added to the document. Layers of white space, mixed upper and lowercase characters, and punctuation. With each layer of markup, we add a bit of clarity and explicitness to the document. First we add white space and the boundaries between words become clear. We introduce mixed upper and lowercase characters, punctuation, and finally more white space, including centering of the initial phrase, intentional line breaks, indentation. And the document now announces itself as a poem, The Roundel, by Victorian poet Algernon Charles Swinburne. It is markup that gives a text its form and shape and helps us determine whether we are looking at a page from a novel or a poem or a business receipt. So markup is not a new concept. Electronic markup derives its name from the pre-digital practice of marking up paper documents with pen and ink or pencil. A handwritten manuscript might be marked up with layout instructions for a typesetter or typist or marked up with revisions by an editor. Digital markup has a long history. Electronic markup is used in word processors, as we see in this screenshot of the early word processor WordStar, which used electronic markup to indicate different formatting options, such as bold, underline, and italics. The typesetting systems Tech and LaTeX, used heavily in the sciences, use a form of markup. The most common electronic markup languages, HTML, the language of the web, and XML, the extensible markup language, are based on SGML, the standard generalized markup language, which became an ISO standard in 1986. SGML was based on the generalized markup language, which was developed as early as 1969. There are different types of markup, presentational, descriptive or semantic, and procedural. We'll be focusing on the first two. 
Many markup languages, such as HTML, are not exclusively one type, but a blend. Presentational markup is perhaps the easiest to understand. Markup codes are inserted into the text to indicate how a span of text should be formatted in some sort of publishing or presentation platform, such as a web browser. The HTML, B, and I tags for bold and italics are examples of presentational markup. In this example, we see three spans of text that are to be italicized, but we don't know why they receive this special treatment. Descriptive or semantic markup attempts to describe the identity or function of parts of the document. For instance, the newer HTML5 tags, article, nav for navigation, and footer identify the text by its function rather than its appearance. The Text Encoding Initiative, or TEI, is an XML vocabulary for encoding scholarly documents, such as novels, poems, dramas, dictionaries, and language corpora. TEI has hundreds of very specific tags for elements such as foreign passages, epigraphs, speeches in a drama, stanzas in a poem, and so on. In the example on the screen, the presentational I tags have been replaced by more meaningful semantic tags. Now we know why these spans of text are italicized. In the first instance, the markup indicates a foreign phrase. Moreover, the markup tells us the language of that foreign phrase. The XML lang, or language attribute, indicates that the language is Latin using the two-letter ISO language code, LA, for Latin. Descriptive markup facilitates a so-called separation of concerns in which issues of presentation and formatting are separated from description of the content. Descriptive markup tells us what the text is rather than how it looks. With this separation, Formatting can be applied in a distinct presentation layer based on the function of the text. For example, title, quotation, name, list, table, and so on. Different processing and presentation layers may be applied for different output devices and use cases. Here's a typical XML publishing scenario. Some documents or data are encoded with descriptive XML markup. XSLT, or Extensible Style Sheet Language Transformations, is a special purpose programming language for transforming and manipulating XML documents. XSLT may be applied to the original XML document to produce HTML output, <coughs> EPUB, or other ebook formats. XSL formatting objects, which may then be converted to PDF or PostScript, plain text, or files of comma-separated values for working with content in databases and spreadsheets. Many other formats are possible. The third form of markup, <coughs> procedural markup, is embedded markup that serves as processing instructions for specific processing systems. Examples of procedural markup include TROF, LaTeX, and PostScript. Given that this is a course on information visualization, I wanted to say a few words about markup and information visualization. As we see in these examples, markup can identify many of the things we're interested in visualizing when we visualize data. So some common things we might be interested in include dates, people, and places. In the first example, we've taken a date that appears in a text written in a human readable form, April the 5th, 1837, which may not be as useful to a computer processing program. The encoding here identifies this phrase as a date and includes the when attribute where we've put that date in a standardized format that the computer can use more easily. In the second example, people, we've identified the name 
Algernon Charles Swinburne is a personal name, and the ref attribute points to an external XML file or database where we have an entry for Swinburne from which we may pull additional information such as birth or death dates. Similarly, in the places example, we have the Isle of Wight, an island off the coast of southern England. That's identified as a place name. And again, the ref attribute refers us to an external XML file and an ID where we can pull additional information, such as alternative names for this place, geographic coordinates, and so on. As we continue our discussion of markup, and in the examples, we will focus on descriptive markup and XML. XML is used as a markup syntax for metadata standards such as Dublin Core and RDF, for web documents written in XHTML or XML expressions of HTML5, and for text encoding initiative or TEI documents used in the digital humanities and digital library communities. Microsoft, Microsoft Office, Office and Open Office and open source, source and Office pardon. Suites <clears throat> use XML as a data format for word processing, spreadsheet, and presentation documents. Many applications and APIs use XML as an input and output format. JSON, the JavaScript object notation, is an alternative to XML that's increasingly used on the web as a lightweight data interchange format for more data-centric applications. But XML remains ubiquitous, especially for longer form or more complex documents such as web pages, office documents, novels, dictionaries, letters, or epic poems. In my own field of digital humanities, whether one is working with digital editions of important literary and historical documents, image collections, big data analysis of thousands or millions of documents, or data mining social media content, one is likely to encounter XML, and knowing a bit about it and how to work with it can be very helpful. Thank you for joining me for this introduction to markup concepts. In the next video segment, we'll be looking at the nuts and bolts of XML and getting you ready to create and work with XML content.